Hello and welcome everyone. I have the top of the hour. My name is Rachel Paul with IAAP and thank you for joining us today for our NeuroAbilities webinar, Cochlear Implants User Experience for Driver for Innovation. Before we begin today, just a few housekeeping items to go over. One, closed captioning is provided. You can select the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your screen. We also have third party captioning link provided in the chat if you prefer that. And we have ASL interpretation provided today as well. All attendee mics are muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. And today's webinar will be recorded and made available afterwards on the G3ICT Norabilities YouTube channel. And we'll post a link to that in the chat as well. And we will have a few minutes at the end for questions. We do ask that throughout, as you think of your questions, please feel free to leave those in the Q&A box and we will get to as many of those as we can. And we ask that uh, we leave the chat for just general questions or any technical questions. We'll be monitoring that for any issues. So I'd like to go ahead and turn it over today to Christopher Lee to introduce our program. Thank you, Rachel. Um, my name is um, Christopher Lee, and um, I am um, the Managing Director of IAAP, um, also the Chief Learning Officer for G3ICT. And if we could back up to the, the first slide. Um, so today uh, we have a, a great presentation set for you. The title is Cochlear Implants, User Experience, a Driver for Innovation. This is one of 12 webinars that we will be doing over the next year. The No Ability Project is um, sponsored um, by the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Um, the foundation um, focuses on AI, bringing together AI, data science, as well as social impact for the greater good. Um, G3 ICT, which is the Global Initiative for Inclusive ICTs, um, is the primary lead for the No Ability Project. The G3 ICT project started back in 26. Its focus is around supporting the Convention on the Rights with Persons with Disabilities. We also are partnered with NCAM, which is the National Center for Adaptive Neurotechnology, which focuses on science as well as the technology in the field of neural technologies. The other partner we have um, is IWAP, which is the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, which is a division of G3 ICT. IWP is focused on the accessibility profession, growing it around um, the certification, around accessibility, professional education, as well as networking. So we have a great event for you. And next slide, please. And as I mentioned, I'm Christopher Lee. We have over 140 individuals registered for this um, conference, which is really exciting as well as about 36 countries. So we're real excited to have everyone. I'm gonna be the event coordinator, which basically means that I get to try to jump in there when I need to, when presenters have gone over time. So that will be my primary role today. As Rachel mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, um, we will have Q&A at the very end. So save those questions, put them in the Q&A, and we'll be wrapping the presentation up with those Q&A. Next slide, please. So we are honored um, to be celebrating today um, the International Cochlear Implant Day, um, which is its 60th anniversary. There's a lot of buzz going around today about this topic. Um, so you can see the hashtag, it's hashtag International Cochlear Implant Day at the very bottom of this slide. Jump on in, get involved in the buzz. G3ICT at G3ICT will also be posting information throughout. Um, through our Twitter account, throughout this presentation. So um, definitely jump on the social media. Next slide, please. Okay, so before I um, introduce our uh, moderator, Lydia Best, um, I just want to tell you briefly a little bit about the No Ability Project. Um, as, it, um, as you may have known, we've been around about a year right now. Um, we all, as I mentioned, we are funded by the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Um, we focus on exploring um, con contributions in neural technologies um, around AI, as well as other technology for the greater good of other people, people that need them. So that's about our project. And as I mentioned, we're about a year old right now. So you've got to jump on the G3ICT.org website to find out more information about the project. 
Okay, so I'm going to turn it over right now to the next slide, which is Lydia Best. Lydia um, has become a friend and a colleague of mine over the last year as we started the Knowability Project. She is um, going to be the moderator today of this session. Um, she is Vice Chair of the ITU Joint Coordination Activity on Accessibility and Human Factors. So Lydia, I will turn it over to you and welcome. Thank you very much, Christopher. It's been a pleasure to work with um, Neural Abilities Program. And um, it's absolute pleasure today to be asked to moderate the webinar. Um, you are right. Um, it is 20, nearly 60 years since we have had the cochlear implant innovation. What I am myself cochlear implant user for 12 years and have one cochlear implant. And um, could I please have a next slide? We have today um, great um, panelists, Sue Archibald, Patrick Hayes, Robert Mandara, Dennis Selznick, and Christian Vogler. I will introduce them as we go along and give you a little bit more information about who they are and um, what type of topics we will be talking about. Next slide, please. But first I was asked to, um, to just a little bit um, explain about what is the cochlea implant. The cochlea implant is an implanted electronic device designed to produce useful sensations of hearing to a person with severe to profound deaf, deafness. And this is the job which the implant is doing is electronically stimulating nerves inside the inner ear. Usually the implants have two main components. One is the externally worn microphone, sound processor, and, and system. And then the second one is the implanted receiver and electrode system, which is also going inside the cochlea. So those devices are being held together by magnet. Just that, that is the shortest possible description. But I would like to bring you back to where we have come from. Because in 1964, we had the first patient implanted with a um, single channel electrode at Stanford University in the US. And that, that implant did not exactly work because it did not stimulate enough hearing nerves for the patient to hear. But it was a major step forward. The next step forward was with 1977 and the metal multi channel implantation. For the first time, patients could actually hear um, very well and understand enough. And the following year, the first multi-channel cochlea implantation was from cochlea company. Those are the major milestones and very important to remember before I will introduce my next speaker. Next slide. So what is the journey of cochlea implants? Well, it started from on your left-hand side, um, the big bulky, body-worn boxes and um, external wires going through the, um, to the magnets on the heads. And then you have gone through a wonderful, colorful behind the ear processors. And finally, the latest innovations are just on the head, small processors um, without being behind the ear. That's how far we've gone. So, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker will be Patrick Dice. Patrick is a corporate director of awareness and public affairs for Medel Worldwide Headquarters since 2013. He has over 28 years of experience in the field of audiology and cochlea implants. Over time, he published widely on these topics. He's also a chairman of the board of Hear It, Abe's Bills, and member of the board of advisors of the Hearing Health Forum EU, and also recently became visiting professor at the University in Brussels, Vria. Patrick, the floor is yours. Could you please tell us what is the next in the cochlear implants? Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, for this very kind introduction. Um, it will be my pleasure to tell you something more about the latest and greatest in cochlear implant innovation. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Very often, 
um, it is seen as innovations can only take part in the audio processor or in the implant. Now, what I want to highlight over the next couple of minutes, that it's not just in these two components where innovations can happen, uh, but there's also other components like, for example, the surgery, for example, the audiology, um, or um, as well, for example, indications. Now let's first tackle um, the audio processor. Um, clearly partially already indicated by Lydia, I think a key component for innovation in uh, the audio processor are by means of miniaturization, going smaller and smaller, because too often um, audio processors are seen as, as too big um, and there's a stigma associated with it. Uh, and obviously also for user comfort, we want to make them smaller. Another innovation aspect is connectivity. How and with which kind of devices do you connect your audio processor? For example, with a cell phone, which is already currently possible, or with your TV, uh, but I'm sure that more possibilities will appear over time. Now, interesting is that um, very often um, in, in a lot of the developed markets uh, or countries, uh, people, um, for sure children will get two cochlear implants, sometimes also adults. But um, what is also common is that people will use a cochlear implant on one ear and have a hearing aid on the other side. Now, um, there are some things there uh, by means of synchronicity, for example, which are not optimal yet, uh, different sound um, spectrums, let's say, um, how things are perceived are not the same. So a lot of things can be done there and will be done there. Um, linked to miniaturization and also to what Lydia said, it's clearly um, is, is the, the effect from going from a behind the ear processor, so worn on the ear, to what is called a single unit processor, um, which doesn't have, where the, the user will have nothing on the ear anymore. Now, a big challenge for cochlear implants are definitely um, speech and noise, so understanding speech and noise and music perception, music appreciation. Um, and one of the following speakers will also talk about music. Now, um, innovation will happen in this field and is already happening. How to further advance that, how to further improve that, um, so that people can also understand really well, for example, in noise. And obviously, improved ergonomics is something by means of innovation, which is a continuous process. Now, bigger innovative steps are happening in the field of the implant itself. Um, recently, um, from the company where I work for, um, we implanted um, fully implantable cochlear implant systems, so you don't have anything on the outside anymore, uh, in two cities in Europe called Liège and Munich. Um, in light of a feasibility study. Now, clearly in X years from now, and it's hard to judge when because it depends on a lot of, of components and parameters, obviously, but in a couple of years from now, um, one can imagine that cochlear implants will be fully implantable. Um, so nothing will be visible anymore. Important is also that when the electrode um, is uh, positioned within the cochlea, um, clearly, there's a risk that inflammation is caused, for example, within that cochlea. Now, that might mean a loss of residual hearing, which is still there. Now, um, innovation is looking also into um, how can electrodes be coated with, with pharmaceutical products, with drugs, so that you can stop or reduce inflammation. Um, currently, cochlear implants work with in, or by electrical stimulation. Um, but um, different research programs are also looking into optical neural stimulation. That would increase, increase specificity, and by that you would have better results even for the users. Currently, it's also so that um, electrodes are placed in a specific um, spot in the cochlea itself, in the hearing organ, which is called the scala tympani. Um, but we are also looking um, as, as a field into what is called interneural cochlear implantation. So putting the electrodes in different positions in the cochlea and seeing whether you have uh, better results like that. Now, if you move to the next slide, um, then you see that apart from the implant and the processor, other um, innovations are also happening. 
So let's first tackle indications. Um, we see that there's expanding indications. The field where uh, people will get, or the, the, the auditory thresholds where people will get a cochlear implant are shifting. Um, they have been shifting over time um, in comparison to a hearing aid, and they will continue to shift even more over time. Um, things like electric acoustic stimulation, so combination of a cochlear implant and a hearing aid in one ear are already becoming more common. Applications such as a cochlear implant in the case of a single-sided deafness, unilateral deafness, um, is, is in research projects already happening. Um, and also clearly a lot of, of research centers are looking into, um, can you suppress tinnitus uh, with electrical stimulation provided by a cochlear implant? Now, the last two domains I want to tackle is audiology and surgery. Within the field of audiology, what one can expect, and which also obviously has been uh, moved faster forward than anticipated by the corona crisis or the COVID-19 crisis, are things like telemedicine and telehealth. So by that, we would allow, or it would allow us for remote programming. So fitting the external part of the cochlear implant from a distance, um, also providing follow-up from a distance, so through internet connections and with interfaces, for example. Um, so you could also check from a distance, is something wrong with the processor? If so, what is wrong exactly? Does a person need to come to the center, to the hospital, yes or no? And you could also provide remote rehabilitation. Um, so people don't need to travel a long distance anymore for the rehabilitation itself but it could also be provided in rural areas, for example, by internet connection. And I think the next step after that is clearly that um, we will go to um, automated programming where uh, probably for standard cases or more standard cases, um, there should be possibilities to do the programming in an automated way. And then where um, the individual fittings, um, where somebody comes to a center will still be applied, obviously, for more difficult cases. The last aspect I want to cover within my presentation is surgery. Also there, a lot of things are happening. Normally now, um, in surgery, um, people come to the hospital, stay one night, two nights, depending a bit on the country, but more and more you see that there are steps taken towards local anesthesia um, in an, in an um, out, in an outpatient concept. So people come in in the morning and leave again in the evening and people don't get total anesthesia anymore. Now, things like that are also facilitated or made easier by things like robotic assisted surgery. So it's not a robot performing the surgery, it's truly assisted. So as you can see on the picture, there's still a surgeon present, but the robot assisted surgery will allow for more precision um, less complications, um, and even in difficult cases, one can define the most optimal way. Um, and by the fact that less drilling will be required in the skull, recovery time will be shorter. And then finally, um, what is also one of the bigger innovations coming is what is called the robotic insertion of the electrode. So as said, the big thing is that um, you might cause inflammation within the cochlea, within the hearing organ when you insert it. So on the one hand, we are looking into applying um, drugs to reduce that inflammation process. But on the other hand, you might also have um, robotic insertion. So you can measure um, and predefine the speed with which you insert your electrode in the cochlea. Um, and the force with which you do that. So by that also, again, reducing um, the potential risk of inflammation. And if people have residual hearing still left in that ear, it might also um, be preserved. So um, that is it in a nutshell. Um, I'll be happy uh, to take answers at the end as suggested by our host. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of things are happening in the field. And I think a lot of these things will be implemented already over the next three to five years, I would say. Thank you very much. Great, great presentation. Great.
Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, you have taken us to future now, back to the future. So it is wonderful to to um, to hear um, what is in store and what is planned. It's great. It's absolutely great. My um, my actually take from this is that we are looking for a lot of miniaturization, and also we're looking at much more. Um, remote kind of support, which some people may prefer, especially in the working age. Um, short uh, time of staying in the hospital already happened to me 12 years ago. It was just come in the morning and late in, at night, go home. Now my next um, speaker is Dr. Christian Voglan, who is himself deaf and a professor and director of the Technology Process Program Research Group at Colored University in the US. And part of his research relates, among others, to uh, user interfaces, connectivity, and uh, as you can see already on the slide, he's got plenty to talk about. He's also a strong advocate for a deaf and hard of hearing perspective in all part of research, all kind of um, work um, which um, relates to anything related to deaf and hard of hearing people. He is the newest member of the cochlear implant users community because he just had his first cochlear implant one and a half years ago. Christian, the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you, Lydia. A little bit more. Um, First of all, I've see I've had it for two years, not a year and a half ago. So it was two years ago. Okay, this is a small difference. I want to emphasize um, my experience with CI, my cochlear implant in general. Uh, first of all, um, oral is very important. Yes, it's part of CI. Uh, in general, um, through my experience, environmental, everybody, everything is very important all around, not just one thing. So speech reading is very important. It's also be able to focus on how um, you use every single day in different experiences with different technology and make sure that um, you could, you, you know, doesn't satisfy everybody one device. Okay. So there's, there's so many people, so much going on, so much technology all over the place. And it's just very, can be very confusing. So I don't want to exaggerate. It is very, all technology um, is being technology advancements. And my wife and I both use, right? So we're both um, deaf and we have technology for different situations. Um, it's not one size fits all, right? Different technology for different things. For example, face-to-face -face communication with technology is different than listening to music or watching movies for technology. So video conferencing is really important to have technology also. So how, how is it all required to use? We have to know how to set up different systems, right? Some of um, measures of things and how to plug and unplug and, and set it all up. It's just horrible sometimes, right? So if you sometimes it's Bluetooth is good, right? But sometimes it's also confusing. It doesn't work also. Oftentimes um, things are set up and how to apply things. Um, you don't have a way to connect things, right? Because sometimes they need to be plugged in. It's very complicated. So it's a user's perspective. It's really horrible. And I don't know why it should be so difficult. I don't, we don't know what's going on and how to make it work. So it's temporary, right? So different styles and different um, technology. Slide, next slide. Okay, next slide. All right. So, but different at the university. So at ASL, so different countries have different things. Okay, so we have different signs in different areas. So sorry for the clarification with the interpreter. Okay. 
So I'm back, back of the slide. Could you go back to a slide a second? One slide. Okay, perfect. All right. We want to expand. Connecting um, audio. It just doesn't always work. Okay. So suppose you have you know, you have a family, and I have you know you have hearing people in your family as well. My wife and I are both deaf, but my kids are hearing. And sometimes it's very difficult to be able to share audio in um, one room, like if we're watching TV or a movie. Um, sometimes if I'm on a call. Um, like the kids are in school or something like that. We're all in one area and it's very complicated. Bluetooth, for example, for audio. Um, my kids are listening and their, and their audio and everything. It sometimes it doesn't get a signal. It's all set up on the TV. So for technology and assistant, assisted listening devices for the TV. So the kids could hear at the same time and I'm trying to be able to focus on the TV and the kids are trying to watch TV. It's just a lot happening. So it's trying to figure out how to turn on the audio for both for the kids to hear and for my, me and my wife to also hear through our assistive listening devices. It's very complicated. <laughs> it's not easy. So for example, my kids have um, required like, my wife and I also, you know, we're deaf, as I said. So something, we have two different mo models, okay? So we have to change the different, make adjustments. The the t we have to have separate televisions and to have separate everything. We don't want to do all that. So, you know, for example, for music or a good, to watch a movie, we have equipment for speech recognition, right? For dialogue, for conversations which is good. And then we have to apply a different one for music or for movies. So which is awful because the equipment that we have for one-on-one -on -one speech recognition is, is one thing and that's pretty good, right? But then it's horrible listening to music through that same device. If you have the drums and the different equipment, you have to replace it and you have to change it. And it's better to hear music with a different piece of assistant listening device. So I wish everything could just like work and sync together, but it doesn't. So also like games, like video games, right? The audio is delayed with a video game. For example, if you like, throw something and something falls and it drops, right? You see it drop, but then you hear a few seconds later, you'll hear the drop sound. So it's just very confusing. So video games, it's important. It's hard um, to connect with the world the same way. With the world also, um, it's very, it's just difficult with our different equipment we wish that would just be able to, the CI would be able to be able to connect equally, but it doesn't. So it, it just depends on e to be reliable, the ease of the setup it would be very reliable. Reliable. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it connects and sometimes it doesn't. So that's very frustrating and it's very confusing. It gets messed up. So if I have an iPhone with my CI, it connects, the iPhone will connect and we could apply um, the ease of the setup and it's a very good experience. It's just, next slide, please. Okay, so broad, so my plea for the future. Okay, first of all is to make 
um, building connectivities, not in silos, right? We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that the world for CI users and the world for hearing people are the same and we have more options so we can just have it simpler. So please, I'm begging you, please make sure that technology um, as you develop is, except, is built in for CI users. And then um, the hearing world technology, make sure that LE audio, um, it's really important, it's really cool, supports both microphones and broadcasts. So that's really important for one-on-one -on -one conversations as well. Also included the point of connectivity with hearing aids and CIs. So I'm praying that's my plea as we look for technology in the future and for CI users, I hope. And also thirdly is technology we want it to make it easier to use for people. We don't want it to be so complicated. We want to look at the people and how to use technology for deaf and hard of hearing people and then include it in the design from the beginning. It may be much easier than fixing it at the end. Thank you very much for, my for your time. I'm done with my presentation. Thank you very much, Christian. <clears throat> you have described some of the wonderful um, um, tribulations I have had myself with um, cochlear implant. Um, so the simplest way um, is always the best. Simple is best. My next speaker is Robert Mandara. Robert is the Vice President of the Euro Cochlear Implant Users Association and is um, someone who has worn hearing aids from four years of age. He's now a bilateral cochlear implant user and he enjoys playing music. So um, he is a very good person to actually talk about music appreciation with cochlear implants. Now, I'm not going to say how long, but um, Robert has worn his cochlear implants because I don't want to get it wrong. So Robert, the floor is yours. I hope you can see me. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name's Robert Mandara. I'm a bilateral cochlear implant user and vice president of the European Cochlear Implant Users Association. Um, EuroCIU comprises 31 associations from 24 countries and represents about 230,000 cochlear implant users. Cochlear implants are optimized for speech and until now music has been considered secondary um, and this has struck me as a bit odd because before I got my implants I was more scared of losing music than I was of losing speech because I'd already lost speech music was the only thing that was keeping me sane. Um, Hearing tests nowadays, they only look at pure tones and speech comprehension. They do not test how we hear music. If anywhere is testing how we hear music, I would like to hear about it. Practice certainly helps with music comprehension, but ultimately there are technical limits that practice will not take us beyond. For example, the implant electrodes do not go far enough into the cochlea to replicate the lowest frequencies. And then features like automatic gain control affect how we perceive dynamics and volume. Um, we also need to consider factors such as persistence, recovery time, crosstalk and refresh rate within the cochlea. Many users experience tinnitus, including me, um, which may be exacerbated by listening to music or get in the way of hearing music, um, rather like having a sheet of music or having a sheet of frosted glass would interfere with your view of the Mona Lisa. Okay, as you can see on the slide, um, music is complicated. It comprises one or many instruments, voices, timbres, rhythms, tempos, pitches, harmonies, dynamics, genres, volume levels, and so on. Cochlear implant users will typically find some of those elements more satisfactory than others. 
the more that is happening at once, the harder it is for cochlear implant users to interpret. Even when a single instrument is being played slowly, the implant user may recognize the tune, but not be able to identify the instrument. A piano, a trumpet or guitar might all be indistinguishable from each other. Users have different expectations for music. Um, casual listeners are more likely to be satisfied than those who sing or play instruments, particularly those instruments which require good pitch perception. So we have to be extremely careful when people claim that music sounds just like it did pre-implant. Familiar music is much easier for implant users to listen to and understand the new music. Um, this is probably because the listener already knows what they expect to hear next. Expectation is important. When I play piano, I know what I expect to hear, so it sounds right. However, if I record what I have played and then play it back, I usually don't recognize what song I am playing. Now, when my implant was first activated, every note from the top to the bottom of the piano sounded exactly the same without changing volume. And no matter how hard I pressed, it would just blink, 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 blink all the way up the keyboard. Um, so then th thanks to the amazing plasticity of the brain, gradually I have learned to identify notes roughly but still, I do not notice if I hit a wrong note. So with 88 keys on a piano and only 22 electrodes in the cochlea, this is hardly surprising. And in terms of what I can hear, rather than playing with my fingers, I might as well be playing with my fist. Melodies of 80s pop music, I grew up in the 80s, um, lack the warmth that they had before implant. On the plus side, I can hear lyrics and intonation better than ever. So I, I have one, but pre-implantation, I love the electronic music of Jean-Michel Jarre, French musician. Nowadays, I struggle to make any sense at all of his music. And so my taste in music and my choice in music has changed. But incidentally, Jean-Michel Jarre famously pressed just one copy of an album called Music for Supermarkets, um, which leaves me wondering what an album of music for cochlear implants might sound like. The manufacturers all make claims about the musical benefits of their implants over the competition, confusing implant candidates with marketing spiel. At this time, my guess is that each brand probably has different strengths in musical rendering. Maybe one is better for opera, maybe another for pop and another for classical. Part of me wonders if the brand themselves are scared of learning that one brand outperforms the others outright for music though, because of the potential impacts on sales. In my opinion, music should be part of all implant users' rehabilitation. Listening to music, dancing, or playing an instrument will help with everything, understanding everything that is not speech. I know that some of the brands employ in-house musicologists with cochlear implants who can offer guidance to their users. Also, recently, some brands have developed apps or PC-based programs to help with musical rehabilitation. In my experience, these tools are in their infancy, but they are a step forward. They require, they require registration, so access to them depends on your brand and where you live. The manufacturers would do very well to recognize that music is a global language. And if they make tools available only to users in certain regions, then they risk alienating and annoying users who live elsewhere. At this time, 
based on my experience, I suspect that the apps benefit the brands who can collect useful data more than they are helping the users. So for the future, I, I think we need independent smart training tools, quizzes and contests to identify how well users of different brands and models appreciate music in the real world. Not just in terms of sound, but also looking at whether music calms the user or makes them feel anxious in the ways that it should do. If privacy rules did not stand in the way, these tools combined with patient data and artificial intelligence could be hugely powerful for improving how cochlear implant users hear music with implants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. It's amazing to, to hear um, your account of uh, music appreciation. And I fully appreciate that. And I'm sure of uh, um, cochlear implant users too. For myself, when I wanted to listen again to Bee Gees, which were my favorite, we just sounded like a stressed parrot. Um, <laughs> luckily, we don't anymore. My next speaker is Sue Archbold. Sue started out as a teacher of the deaf, um, being a teacher of a first child of cochlear implant as well, and then managed the Nottingham Cochlear Implant Program from its inception for 15 years. She works globally to improve access to cochlear implants and lifelong services for all who could benefit as part of improved ear and hearing care. Sue has worked with children and adults adapting to cochlear implants, as well as supporting power of users advocacy. So this is your cue, Sue. So the floor <laughs> is yours. Thank you, Lydia. And thank you, everybody, um, for participating in this exciting event. It's really a pleasure to be here. And the title of the event, User Experience, the Driver for Innovation, is really a subject dear to my heart and putting the user at the centre. The title that Lydia gave me was User Adoption, Challenges and What's Been Accomplished. I've added, or not, because here we are, Cochlear Implant International Day, over 50 years of development, and where are we? Well, we do know that cochlear implants are safe. We know they're effective. We know they're cost effective. We do know that user satisfaction's high when we ask and when we listen, but only five to 10% of those in high income countries who could benefit receive one. And of course, in low and middle income countries, the situation's even more challenging. We also know that there's huge variation across countries. And when we start to unpack that and explore that, what we find is often that where cochlear implantation take up is high, then advocacy work by user groups and family groups has been extremely strong. The advocacy work can make a difference. So next slide, please. So why this gap after all this time? Well, last year we did a global survey about the barriers to cochlear implants, but it was a global survey of users and families, asking them what they'd experienced as the barriers. Well, the lack of awareness of the impact of hearing loss and deafness came up at the top every time, especially for those who've been deafened and the lack of awareness of the impact of cochlear implantation, even by audiologists, even by medical practitioners, and certainly by funders of uh, healthcare. And these two factors can lead to a lack of referrals to cochlear implantation and to a lack of funding. And of course, that's getting much more challenging. Hear managing hearing loss, managing and providing cochlear implants may not be seen as a priority, particularly when at the moment we have uh, healthcare services and healthcare funding being really challenged by the pandemic. But actually, improving communication and effective communication by addressing hearing loss, we do know is cost effective. We've produced uh, accessible materials called Spend to Save, 
if we spend money on managing hearing loss well, then actually we can change lives and, and save society money. But again, when we did our uh, survey, our review of families and users, one topic that came up again was that rehabilitation and lifelong support for cochlear implants can often be lacking and may in extreme cases even lead to non-use of implants as it can for hearing aids and certainly to the lack of potential benefit. Because managing this technology isn't intuitive as we've just heard. The technology isn't always easy or straightforward to use. If you have a look at the left-hand photograph in the British rain, you'll see my neighbour, Rosemary, who became deaf in her 60s, implanted in her 70s, and she has uh, arthritis, she has macular degeneration, so she's going blind, and she has a husband with dementia. So she has a lot on. A cochlear implant has absolutely transformed her life. Without her implant, she would not be able to live independently, nor would her husband. But, as I said before, the managing the technology isn't intuitive. And guess where she comes if she needs a hand? Knock, knock on the door. And even after over 30 years experience in the cochlear implant field, it isn't always intuitive. But progress is being made. My colleagues in Cochlear said I could use those photographs if we said that they listen and they have listened and huge progress is being made. Rosemary took home her box of bits and the uh, slide that we saw before was really uh, interesting to see all the uh, spaghetti of connectivity. Bluetooth, the strides in Bluetooth, of course, have made a huge difference. But again, that's not always intuitive. And as Rosemary said, I wonder how many remote controls do I need in my life? And managing the technology with your arthritis, with not being able to see well, is can be extraordinarily difficult. But thank goodness we're making huge strides. And hopefully the box of spaghetti will be soon a thing of the past. The strides, though, may not always be useful. Miniaturization looks a really uh, great option, not if you're Rosemary. So moving on, we're making the technology easier to use all the time, great strides forward. But users of cochlear implants need rehabilitation and lifelong care and support for managing their technology not just access to cochlear implantation. Next slide, please. So how do we change this? Well, my background in research is in qualitative research rather than quantitative research. In qualitative research, where we explore the views of the families and the users and rigorously report it and find out what actually needs, uh, what's actually important to them. What are the issues that are important to them? And it's not always what the clinicians think, and it's not always what the researchers in a laboratory think. What do users and families really want for their research and advocacy work? The qualitative research reporting uh, on what they feel gives rise to really useful advocacy resources because the users and families know what's important what they want and what they need and the government listens to them government funders actually listen to the reports that we can give accessible reports in an accessible format that are easily understandable because it's not just about numbers and sets of numbers and scores it's about changing lives and when advocacy groups get together, they can be extremely effective. In the UK, we achieved a change in the guidelines to improve access to cochlear implantation, working with professionals, working with industry, in partnership with the users and the families having an equal seat at the table. 
In Romania and the Czech Republic, there's been a successful campaign for replacement processors. In Uganda, Eddie's achieved the waiving of tax on hearing technologies coming into the country. So I'm delighted to be here today on Cochlear Implant International Day, because today we're launching Kika, a cochlear implant uh, community of action globally with cochlear implant advocacy groups working together, endeavoring just to close that gap in provision of cochlear implantation and lifelong aftercare. Uh, because we do know that cochlear implants can change lives and save society money too, if they're well managed for the lifetime. So if you go and have a look at kickernet.org, you'll see what we're about and you'll find some accessible materials for advocacy. So thank you for the time to actually present that. Thank you. Thank you very much, So This is wonderful to hear about advocacy efforts and how um, good, good they are for everyone. Now I need to speak to Denis, bring Denis Selznick to our um, panelists. Denis is um, also cochlear implant user and he is a business development manager in T-Mobile Accessibility. Denis will share his insights and lessons learned, not just as a product innovator, for accessibility, but himself as the user. So, Denise, you have five, six minutes maximum. Off you go. Mm -hmm. You betcha, Lydia. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, for all your attendees out there, it's great to have you here. Um, even with cochlear implants being an innovative and changing technology, I'm glad we're able to recognize that there are limitations on cochlear implants. That means that there's still a need for accessible technologies to supplement cochlear implants. I've had hearing loss all my life. I've ended up in situations where I'm less than confident about being able to participate, understand, or even succeed. I've been fortunate enough to end up working for one of the best companies for accessibility, T-Mobile, and doing the kind of work that allows me to innovate new ways to remove barriers, not just for others, but for myself too. Before I can talk about accessibility challenges, I need to paint the picture of my hearing loss journey. So after losing my hearing at the age of three, I basically tried to live relying on hearing aids. They were, they were barely adequate for what I needed them for. It took all of my energy to participate in school activities. And I just had so little left for socializing. Uh, it was an incredibly frustrating experience to get through the everyday activities with limitations on hearing. And so at the age of 20, I managed to acquire an advanced bionic cochlear implant. It was like night and day. So I was able to hear well enough on the telephone. I was able to start enjoying music and just starting to experience the breadth of sound that I'd missed out on. So at least from my experience, the difference between hearing aids and cochlear implants is staggeringly different. The thing is, even after all this incredible improvement, I still wasn't able to understand as much as someone without hearing loss. We talk about things like speech recognition, or speech discrimination scores, noise tests, and oral rehabilitation, but cochlear implants are not a perfect remedy for hearing loss. The point I'm trying to make is that there still is a vital need for accessible technologies for people with hearing loss. Real-time caption, sign language interpreters, speech recognition technologies, amplification, captions for telephone calls. Getting a cochlear implant is not a cure. Cochlear implants are a tool, and the results are on a spectrum. You can have near com complete hearing restoration to possibly benefiting through you know, maybe sensing environmental and directional cues. So there's still that gap, um, especially in this pandemic where the usual in-person interactions have become very challenging. But there are solutions to help cochlear implant users and other people with hearing loss achieve what's called functional equivalence. And the goal there is to be the equal in, in capability to someone who does not depend on assistive technology. I'm just going to give two examples of a limited amount of time. Mask wearing. Um, mask wearing defeats the ability to read lips uh, to supplement cochlear implant programming. Uh, but there are, there are innovative solutions, um, such as having a, a directional microphone or speech recognition applications on your mobile device. Um, 
Uh, another scenario that has made more challenging, um, especially these days, is uh, working from home or or not being at the same position as where your workplace is. So you, you may rely more on video conferencing application software, like uh, the one we're using today. Um, it just makes everybody into this noisy, chatty box on the screen, and you use a lot of energy focusing on hearing what is being said rather than so much on the content itself. But having assistive technologies or or accessibility, captions, transcripts, um, sign language interpreters, uh, relieve that use of energy and focus uh, so you can be more of a participant. Um, so what I wanna do is just wanna encourage, in, in, inspire yourself to be innovative in ways to close the gap between cochlear implants and those who don't use cochlear implants. And I hope you'll find it um, and get some great ideas from a panel like this one. Um, so thank you for, for letting me chat, and I'll turn it back over to Lydia. Lydia, is Christopher back on? Um, we have a couple of minutes for um, questions. Um, we do have a last slide that I know that you want to talk a little bit about, Lydia, and that's the World Hearing Day. Thank you, Christopher, Christian, Christopher. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I've got Christian and Christopher here. Um, yes, um, together with Sue Archbold, who is also a patron of um, National Association of Different People, the charity I am chair of, we are organizing an um, event in the UK Parliament to raise awareness of um, content of the New World Report, hearing report, which will, is um, going to be launched on the 3rd of March in, um, from Geneva by the World Health Organization. There is a lot of advocacy um, going on at the moment. And um, we, together with Sue, su suggest that everybody takes part in it because we need to make a lot of noises for the hearing. Thank you. Um, Christopher, do you want to um, to contact the questions now? Yes, we. Uh, this is Christopher again, and why don't we bring up all the panelists um, so we can see your faces? All right, and we have Lydia. I know you have one, the first question that you want to dive into. We probably have one or two. We've got a couple in the chat that Cassandra could probably read one. But I'll let you start off with your question. Again, panelists, turn on your um, your video. We have some shy panelists. <laughs> Lydia, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Hopefully, someone will jump on. There we go. This is Christopher. Excellent. Go ahead, Lydia, ask your question. I think you're on mute. Okay. So we have some of the questions which have been answered at the moment, um, but one is, for example, from Natalie, I wear hearing aids, but I don't dare to get cochlear implant. What she's wondering and worrying that um, the cochlear implant might not work for her. Um, what would our panelists, panelists say about that? Who wants to go first? <laughs> so. Is that okay? Thank you. It's a really important question and assessment for cochlear implantation needs to be really thorough and it needs to be multi-professional and very carefully done for just such the reasons as she says. But, but when you ask users of implants, what was it that tipped you over to making a decision to go ahead with an implant? The usual answer is it was speaking to other users of implants. It wasn't talking to professionals and so on. They could listen to uh, a professional telling them the facts, the numbers, the likelihoods, the issues, but actually meeting another user who'd had the same doubts and same concerns uh, uh, was the bit that tipped the balance for the decision making and provided them some with reassurance. There's nothing like talking to somebody else who's in the same boat. But having said that, you do need careful assessment with people that you can trust and who are highly experienced in the field before going ahead. Thank you. 
Thank you. And there is another interesting question. Um, so if anybody else wants to answer as well. But um, there is a question about synchronity when using two cochlear implants. I'm not so sure about um, using two cochlear implants, but what do the users face about uh, with synchronity seg sequently bilaterally implanted with two different brands of cochlear implants? Um, anybody wants to answer that? I don't think it's very much heard of. Yeah, Patrick, off you go. Okay, so um, I think there's two different aspects. On the one hand, there's the aspect of having a cochlear implant on one side and a hearing aid on the other side. Um, and there it has been shown or it's known that there's a certain delay time, um, you know, how signals are processed, let's say briefly, um, and that a cochlear implant is much faster than a hearing aid. Now that might lead to some problems. However, um, what we see at the end is that um, there's such an amount of, of brain plasticity um, that at the end, I mean, you know, users get used to it sometimes very quickly, sometimes it takes a bit longer. Um, and, and, and at the end, people don't see that as a problem anymore or they don't report it as a problem anymore. Now, if you consider the question between um, two different brands of cochlear implants or two different generations of cochlear implants on, on both ears, um, also there, I mean, I mean, I think literature on two different brands is very limited. Um, but also there, you don't see a lot of reports that that it's not working. I mean, I think it all depends on the brain plasticity, and you see that the brain adapts. Um, and, and, and I think more research needs to happen, how and what this, this, this is happening, let's say. Um, but clearly it is working even with, with two different generations of cochlear implants on both ears or two different brands sometimes even. But I mean, if you choose for two different brands, I want to get back to the comments of Christian, um, where he was also saying about a lot of the practicalities, the different cables, the different chargers, I think that's also obviously an additional problem which we then would face. We Thank have, you very uh, much, Patrick. Have, Christopher? We have Your reached problem. our time. What a great panelist. Bravo. Bravo. Excellent. Thank you so much for participating. Again, keep in mind, everyone, this is the second of 12 webinars we're having. We're going to put up on the, the screen right now our next webinar, which is March 25th, and it's on exoskeleton. So you definitely want to check that out. I know we didn't have a lot of time for questions. In the chat, there is a, an email, noabilities at g3ict.org. Please send your questions in and um, we'll get back to you with those. Um, we're also on Twitter, as you can see, and we're also on YouTube. I want to thank the, the um, noabilities team, um, Francesca, the great work she's done, Cassandra, Rachel, and Teresa, all of them, um, we have such a great team. Um, I wanna also thank the presenters, bravo again, thank you. The accessibility team, Beth, you're awesome, done a great job, as well as our captionists. So with that, um, and oh, I do wanna thank all, definitely our funder, Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Thank you very much. Join us for March 25th um, for our next webinar. Take care and have a good day.